So my first real contact with Quechua was as an undergraduate student. Uh, I received a scholarship to study in Bolivia. And although Quechua wasn't part of the program, we did learn a lot of vocabulary words and were around Quechua speakers. And I think that's something that stuck with me uh, for many years afterwards. Um, I kept thinking about the Andes, about the people that I'd met. And when I came to OSU, I had the opportunity to finally formally begin learning Quechua. Uh, was it something I expected? No. But uh, there was an opportunity to do so, and it aligned with my broader interests, and uh, both personal and professional. And so I began formally studying Quechua in Peru in 2013 at Centro Tinku. I had an intensive course uh, which was at the time funded through the Center for Latin American Studies here. When I came back, I had a full academic year of Quechua here at OSU, which was followed by another intensive program in Peru, the same institution. And since then, I've continued studying Quechua, but much more on my own terms and, and uh, you know, following my interests. So, overall, um, I've had you know a mix of formal and informal study and continue to learn all the time. Uh, but it's not a language that you just learn overnight. It's very different than the other languages I've studied. So I'm a linguistics student and um, I've had to study a number of languages, uh, Spanish, Portuguese, French, Catalan, uh, but this is different altogether. And so in that sense, it was also really rewarding uh, to be able to study something that complemented my own work and at the same time allowed me to you know, go into communities and uh, you know, practice a language that is not as common. Uh, and I just found it really rewarding. My dissertation field work specifically is about global education in Peru and programs in which uh, Quechua and Spanish are um, being taught to international students, mostly from North America. Now, while part of that research is focused on students, a lot of it's focused on local community partners uh, and the people who are associated with these programs, uh, many of which are Quechua speakers, perhaps the majority are. And while my level of Quechua is not what I would necessarily want in order to, let's say, um, focus solely on Quechua and do an entire dissertation on Quechua. It is an important part of my project. And it's really allowed me uh, access to um, communities, to people that might otherwise um, not be able to interact with me uh, on the same level um, because, uh, because their Spanish is a second language or um, simply that by speaking Quechua, it opens a lot of doors. Um, people see that you care, that you're interested, and overall uh, want to talk to you. Um, they're curious, right? And it's also through the language that they've been able to share a lot with me that I think they wouldn't be able to express otherwise. So, first of all, um, most of the other languages that I've studied, obviously besides English, are Romance languages, uh, which would make sense being in Hispanic linguistics, perhaps. Quechua is part of a language family that is considered an isolate, so it's not related to any other language. Um, Quechua, of course, is many different languages, but they're all um, interrelated. And so, in a typological sense, so thinking about comparing Quechua to other languages, um, it's different in the sense that, uh, you know, vocabulary, grammar are particular to that language family. Um, there's also a lot of influence from Aymara. And the way that the grammar works, the morphology works, um, the semantics, so the real meaning um, behind how verbs and um, the grammar uh, and how native speakers kind of understand the relation between the language and the world that they inhabit is different. And it's in that sense that uh, I would say studying Quechua is kind of 
made me think about things that I never thought before, thought about before, and kind of opened my eyes to a different way of understanding, of being, of perceiving. Um, so it's in that sense. I received a Fulbright Hayes Fellowship from the U.S. Department of Education back in 2015, which allowed me to study in Peru uh, for 12 months doing dissertation research. Now that fellowship was um, very much tied to Quechua because uh, Fulbright Hayes cares a lot about uh, foreign and second language education. And in particular, my project uh, was looking at one of their areas of interest, which is global education. And so while I was there, I was collecting data. I was doing some preliminary analyses of data. I was meeting people, networking, and uh, interviewing, including interviews in Quechua. I conducted over 40 interviews in Quechua, which uh, was a challenge, um, but I learned a lot. And people opened up to me in a way that I never expected. And I think that's because, like I said again, when you speak Quechua, when you show that interest, people invest in you, people care about you because you've shown already that you care about them. Well, obviously it depends on each person <laughs> and where they're at, uh, where they see themselves going in the future. However, I think for anyone who's really interested in the Andes or is interested in learning a language that uh, is a challenge, but also a, the type of challenge that opens doors, that uh, makes you think about things in a new way, in a critical way, and Quechua is a great option. Um, and why? So if someone is thinking about going to the Andes, doing work in the Andes, doing research in the Andes, Quechua opens a lot of doors. Um, you don't have to speak Quechua really well in order to um, reach people on a personal level. And I think, you know, it's not just about linguistics or studying language, studying literature, culture, um, but I think even people in the business world, uh, in the sciences, benefit from speaking Quechua if they're going to be in the Andes interacting with uh, local people. Well, the question of practicality is interesting because mm -hmm. I would say most people who study a language here at OSU study Spanish. Uh, I don't know if that's a majority overall, but it's the biggest one. And you know, a lot of students uh, never end up using Spanish after they leave, um, don't interact much with Spanish speakers. Um, so thinking about practicality, I think it's more than just the idea that I'm never going to use this in the future. I think it's uh, also about how is studying this language going to make me think in a new way, analyze in a new way, uh, question my fundamental ideas about how um, language works, about how the world is. And I think in that sense it's practical. Uh, I think each language um, is a type of window into a different world. And when we study Spanish and we study French, um, commonly taught languages, we're peering into a different world, but it's a world that is still a lot like our own um, in many ways. With Quechua, you're getting a window into a world that's quite different. It doesn't mean that you can't relate to it or understand it, but what I think it means is that um, it makes us think a lot about our own culture, our own language, um, and in that sense I think it's really practical. Obviously, it's very practical for someone who's thinking about doing research in the Andes or working in the Andes or even being in the Andes for an extended period of time where you're interacting with um, the people there. Well, there are a lot of different examples. Um, one that I can think of off the top of my head right now would have to do with how in Quechua um, we talk about the future and the past. So in most Western cultures, I would imagine nearly all of them or all of them, we tend to think about the future being in front of us and the past is behind us. Right? And so we're moving forward into the future and we're facing the future. But in Quechua it's the opposite. 
um, the ideas in part that we're moving backwards into the future. And why is that? Uh, well, people would explain that by saying, we can see the past, right? We see what's happened. And obviously our sight and seeing is, is central to our experience. And we don't know what the future holds. And in that sense, it's behind us, right? Because we can't see it yet. Um, so that's one of these things where it makes you begin to think about what are these basic assumptions that we have about how the world works or what human experience is. Um, and it's through that reflection that I think you get a lot out of studying Quechua or a similar language. Well, I think it relates to some of the things that I've already said. Um, I would say part of a personal interest in studying languages, um, at least for myself, has to do with um, the, the people that I meet through studying that language and through speaking that language. And it really makes you invested. Now, oftentimes with these less commonly taught languages, you're meeting people, you're interacting people with people uh, that are very different than you are. And who see the world very differently than you do. Um, and it's not to say that you know you can't have that studying Spanish, because you absolutely can. But I think when you study a language like Quechua, it, it pushes you out there. It forces you out of your comfort zone. Uh, it forces you to interact, or at least to, to you know, be around people that um, you wouldn't have normally been around. And I think in that sense, it's a motivation and relates to my personal investment in studying a less commonly taught language. Now, um, there are a lot of languages out there that aren't commonly taught. And uh, so what benefit does Quechua have over other languages? It's hard for me to say. Um, I haven't studied a lot, of, uh, a lot of those languages. But I do know that, that Quechua is rewarding for those reasons. Um, and I imagine, you know, with other languages, you'd find a similar, a similar thing. One that comes to mind is um, related to um, a trip that I took with another uh, student uh, who speaks Quechua. And we went up to a highland community where she was conducting field work. And uh, we got to know a lot of people there, um, monolingual Quechua speakers and others. We went on a hike to, to find people. And you know, a lot of these folks are with their, their animals up in the hills. Um, their, their living is very um, different than what we have. Uh, I think that's the best way to describe it. You know, getting to know these people um, laughing with jokes, um, they show you things. But also, um, there are things that here in the U.S. might make us upset, which um, to them is part of everyday life. For example, um, losing a pet dog because of some type of tragedy, whether another animal kills it or um, doesn't have any food and starves. And those things are part of everyday life. Um, and, you know, talking to people about it makes you think differently about how we interact with animals. And uh, another example that I can think of relates to research that I did on Tequila Island in Puno on Lake Titicaca. Uh, tequila is a catch speaking uh, island. There are different communities there. And uh, I have really fond memories um, meeting people there when we'd walk around the island. We'd look at pre-Incan ruins. Uh, we climbed to the top. It showed me where different things are on the lake. Uh, we have a lot of memories um, cooking food in the kitchen. Um, all of us around. You know, grandma's there, children are there. And um, they would tell me about you know, things in the past in their life. Uh, in a lot of the interviews that I did in Quechua, um, people related, relayed really personal stories about things that had happened to them. Um, for example, uh, hunger and childhood and essentially being passed off to other families uh, in, a, in a type of form of um, indentured servitude. 
or when um, the Maoist terrorist groups in Peru uh, would arrive in certain villages and what that was like. Um, and those are really fond memories because I will always remember those stories and the things that they told us about and um, think about also how it relates to my own life. So grad school can be difficult, it can be stressed, um, but then I think about you know these people who I met and what their lives are like and it gives me it gives me strength and it um, tells me you know to move forward and to keep in mind that um, as bad as I think things are sometimes um, you know we all deal with different problems and uh, we have to keep moving forward Look, um, sometimes I think about how did I end up uh, spending so much time in the Andes? How did I end up studying Quechua? These weren't things that I ever thought about for myself. Uh, I never imagined that I would be in Peru for a year doing field work on a fellowship really tied and connected to Quechua, um, that I'd be interacting with the people that I, that I have. Um, you know, sometimes these things um, just can't be foreseen. But I do know in my case, um, it's the people that I've met and the communities that I've become part of that really propel me to, to keep moving forward. And so there is studying the language um, you know, for its own purpose. Um, I think Quechua is fascinating if you're into thinking about grammar, if you're into thinking about um, the intricacies of language. Um, but to me, language is ultimately also about people and the people who speak it. And they're what really motivate me to move forward and keep studying Quechua, keep speaking Quechua, uh, keep studying Quechua on my own um, when I can because um, I care about them and it makes me care about Quechua.